Thanks for staying with us. It's time now to go to the papers and see what the headlines are. And to help us discuss that, those headlines is Mr. Nick Agule, Public Affairs Analyst. Good morning and well, oh, yeah, good morning and welcome from Nigeria. Good morning and welcome and good evening to you uh, where you are. Uh, yes, uh, good evening uh, here in Langley, in British Columbia. It's, it's just uh, 11.30 something p.m. now. Oh, okay. So while we are awake, um, you are uh, preparing to go to bed. And at least, mm -hmm, at least we have something that we are ahead of the Western countries, you know, our time. You know, we entered the new year before the Western countries. We did try to now. God made it that way. Yes, uh, <laughs> we have to try to, to do something with that new year we enter first. Yes. We have to unlock value from it. Yeah. Okay, today let's begin with um, the uh, Daily Independent. Uh, the headline here is saying, uh, NEC revs up process, or that is creation of state police. NEC revs up process gives four states September 9 to submit report. Uh, to adopt, that, those are the writers, those are the writers, to adopt comprehensive report on Monday, uh, federal government releases 3 billion naira to states affected by flooding and Bill Gates to inject $2.8 billion in Nigeria's healthcare agric sectors. Okay, so uh, your comment on that. Next reps of uh, process gives four states September 9 to submit a report on creation of state police. Absolutely. Uh, uh, the creation of state police has become an imperative. It's very important. I will, we understand the risk that exists that uh, governors can hijack the state police and use them for illegal activities. Just the same way they have hijacked their to sweep uh, local government elections to the ruling party. But there has to be something before, if it generates issues, it can be resolved. So like uh, here in Canada, that uh, I'm speaking to you from, uh, it is cities that have their police. So Vancouver has a police force. You know, it's not even a state or provinces. So there are, there are police forces at different levels. So university campuses have their police. The trains have their police, the transport police. Um, there are police at uh, city level, at county level, provincial level, and then there is national police. Mm. You know, so at, at, if we have this mass of police all around the country, the Nigeria will become a lot more secured. And what it is today now. And we have always made this point. I especially make this point that the concept of policing is pretty much local. Uh, it's very difficult to have a, a national police only uh, for the country. And, you know, it's like putting all our eggs in one basket. So if the inspector general is not effective, that means the entire policing in Nigeria is not effective. But if policing is devolved to the state, we'll have 36 heads of police. And if, if it's 20 of them that are effective, that will be better than what we, we get if one IG is ineffective. Uh, giving money to the states for flooding, again, this is uh, reactive. The question is that what is causing this flooding? Why is it that every year we experience this flooding? Government needs to begin to take proactive action to stop the flooding, to prevent the flooding. Because the flooding comes, it washes away people's properties. Sometimes it takes people along with them. People lose lives. So what would 3 billion naira do now? But if we're proactive and we stop the flooding, meaning we have a erosion control, uh, rivers are dredged, we're ready for flooding. And when it comes, it doesn't uh, impact negatively on us. That would be better. And then talking about Bill Gates, $2.8 billion. That's a lot of money. But Bill Gates has such money. He's a billionaire. So we know he has such money. My only advice to him is that when the $2.8 billion come, and he's actually targeting very critical sectors, agriculture, which is the main, main, the mainstay 
of Nigeria's economy that has been ignored for so long. And if he activates that, it's going to create jobs to assure food security, and then it will reduce our imports, import dependence for agricultural uh, raw materials and produce and products, and it will help with uh, post service losses and all of that. And the healthcare is also another area where really very backward. So but my advice to Bill Gates is that he should never put that money through the government bureaucracy. If he ever dare puts that money in the government bureaucracy, that money is gone. So he has to find collaborators on ground, you know, that have been tested and tried over time to execute projects of such magnitude. And he should work with them. He should work with those local partners and just give government uh, distance, real distance. Otherwise, his $2.8 billion will end up in some account in Dubai or in some uh, mortar or somewhere uh, around the world. Well, he, b before that pledge was made, made um, I don't know, it, he was talking with the government. He was even at the National Economic Council meeting that was uh, presided over by the vice president. He was there with Aliko Dangote and made presentation. So already, uh, I think the government has its feet uh, to the ground. You know, maybe that money will come to them. Maybe what we'll be looking at is just making sure that he puts a mechanism on ground that will monitor how his money is being spent. But let's go back to the, um, uh, the, the issue of uh, state police. My worry, a little bit of worry, is that all of us were talking about state police. Some were for, some were against, so it was a to be or not to be thing. Um, I didn't know it got to a stage where uh, states were even giving uh, inputs for this state police creation, and the, the amount of involvement of the ordinary people as to how this thing should work doesn't seem to be so prominent because we just know now that the states have been given till September 9 or so to uh, bring their final input to um, the formation of state police. I think, I'm thinking, I don't know whether that happened, but I'm thinking that the people of Nigeria were not consulted enough to know what they really want and how they want it when it comes to state police and, and policing in, in, in our country. Because it's like, okay, so this thing we're saying, maybe it can happen or maybe it cannot happen. Uh, it is really happening. And we don't know anything that has been put down by the states and given to the federal government. Does it not concern you? It's, it's, it's quite uh, concerning. Uh, but before I even respond to the state police, uh, let me just talk about the Big Gates one. Uh, yes, indeed, he has come. And he has been a lazy with government at various levels. I think it's the right thing to do. If you are bringing such quantum of money into an economy, you need to get uh, the government uh, support on your, on your side. So that's fine. But uh, there can be no mechanism. I will assure him, if this um, interview that we are doing, if this program gets to him, uh, I will advise him that there is no mechanism that he's going to deploy that these government officials are going to deal with his money honestly. These people have put themselves, they are professionals in the act of taking money from government coffers into their personal coffers. There's really nothing that he's going to do. Absolutely nothing. If he likes, he can try it. And when his fingers are burnt, he will come back and say, oh, whoa. He should have listened to the advice of uh, Plus TV Africa that was given to him. Nigerian officials have institutionalized taking money from the public treasury into their private pockets. It's an industry. They have all sorts of qualifications. They know how to do it. And they can do it. I mean, Bigay should have seen that palliatives during COVID, palliatives that were put together by the private sector, which they mistakenly now put in care of the government, either ended up in the markets or in warehouses all over the country. They didn't go to the people who needed them. I think with that, I have, I have done QED of the position. So it is left for him. Let him do whatever he wants to do with his money. But my advice is that if he really wants his money to get to the ground, he should work with 
local partners who have been tested and trusted in the past. Now, coming to uh, state police, I agree with you. Because for me, I also knew that there was some noise that was that were being made about state police at some point. Then everything went quiet. You know? So if the states were then given the mandate to come back to the federal with what their idea of state policing should be, one would have expected the states to now engage the people. Mm -hmm. To say, okay, state police is coming. What input do you guys have? And also, I, I, if I if I think about this thing, I think that state police can happen only if there's a constitutional change, <laughs> because the constitution of Nigeria right now, as we speak, recognizes only the Nigerian police force, recognizes an, an inspector general of police, and puts forth how he can be appointed and his confirmation at the Senate and all of that. So how can state police now be created without a constitutional change? And constitutional change will usually come with public hearings and all of that. So I don't actually know what process now that is being followed, whether it is when these governors bring their input, then the federal is going to consolidate them, articulate this, and then put a bill to the National Assembly for the creation of state police. Perhaps that is what they want to do. And then at the point of uh, the B going through the National Assembly, it is where public hearing will happen and all of that. But I will also say that it mustn't be compulsory. <clears throat> I don't think it should be made compulsory. States that want to have police should be allowed to have police. States that don't want to have state police should also be left alone. <laughs> they want to watch and see what will happen before they come on the bandwagon. So it mustn't be something that all states must key in at the same time. That's the way I also look at it. Okay. Um, another one here, on the, still on the Daily Independent. Petrol price hike will affect Nigerians' real sector. That's according to Manufacturers Association of Nigeria. On the same page, we have petrol pump price increase, a recipe for crisis, PDP warns. Um, the writer is... Well, the riders are, Tinubu didn't promise uh, not to ri raise petrol price. That's according to the presidency. Uh, says increase in petrol price became unavoidable. NLC insists president promised not to hike uh, PMS price. Order NNPCL to reverse itself, Afeniferre tells Tinubu. All those ones are about uh, fuel uh, pump price. They, they, it was rumor that the federal government had asked the NNPCL to raise pump price to maybe 1,000 naira or so. The federal government came out to deny that. And then the NNPCL started, or this, there was another rumor because uh, a, a letter was on the social media that um, the NNPCL had directed their filling stations, their outlets, to be selling fuel at a particular price, which is so high from uh, the previous price or the normal price they were selling, and NNPCL denied it. Even when they started actually selling, their communications manager came out to say that he's not aware that that is happening, even when their filling stations, their outlets were selling at uh, almost 900 naira per liter. Now people are crying. The PDP has come out to say it's a recipe for, for trouble. Uh, Fede Ferrer is saying the same thing, and uh, Manufacturers Association is saying the same thing, and all experts are saying the same thing. But uh, the presidency is saying that President Tinubu did not promise he will not uh, raise the price of fuel. I don't know how you will respond to that. It's fuel saga. It's like a mafia. You know, nobody knows what's happening. And just like a mafia, nobody wants to associate with them. Even the president, who is the minister for petroleum, how can he say he doesn't know what is happening? This is not right. You know, the president on 29th of May 2023 said fuel subsidy is gone. And then we are now presented with a $6 billion bill, which they are saying is a shortfall. What does that mean? You know, if NMPC brings in petrol and the cost at which they have landed the petrol, which of course nobody knows, they never disclose it to anybody. That's why I say it's mafia-like uh, type of uh, arrangement. 
And then they are selling the petrol at a price that is lower than what they brought in. Who gave them approval to do that? How could NMPC put Nigeria into a debt of $6 billion without approval from the presidency? Without approval from the National Assembly? Without approval from anybody? Is the presidency trying to say the NMPC on their own decided that if they land petrol at 1,000 Naira, that they will sell it at 690 on their own without consulting anybody. They did not consult the Minister for Petroleum. They did not consult the Minister of State for Petroleum. They did not consult with the Minister of Finance. Nobody. Only NMPC. How can that be possible? But if that is possible, then truly the NMPC have become a god upon themselves. Of course, there has to be sanctions now. The, the president has to be showing anger that I, Mr. President, declare that fuel subsidy is gone. The UNMPC, without consulting me, went and started selling petrol at below the cost, accumulating debts of $6 billion. Then the management of NMPC should not be in office, even for one more day. But see, we are not seeing that kind of anger coming from the presidency. We are not seeing such anger coming from the National Assembly. We are seeing no such anger coming from the Minister of Finance or from anybody, Minister of State for Petroleum. Nobody is showing such anger. Come on. I think these people need to be more honest with Nigerians than what we're hearing now. Mm -hmm. And this is really sad. Well, it's sad because nobody knows about the data. We don't, the Minister of Finance was on TV the other day saying he doesn't even know how many liters of where petrol are consumed in Nigeria in the day. The same Minister of Finance say, oh no, that is the petrol is not going as far as Central Africa, as Central Africa region. West African region is already a given that our petrol is going there. And the NPC is not telling us the landing cost. They the same NPC now say they are the only ones who will buy down go take petrol. Look, where do these people want to take Nigerians to? It's so hard, it's difficult. Can they empathize with Nigeria just for once and try and have a sense of what people are going through? Workers have not even seen 70,000 naira minimum wage. In fact, as we speak, there are workers who are still on 18,000 naira minimum wage. Because there are some states that do not even implement 30,000 minimum wage. How can those workers come to work? How can they feed their families? How can they buy food? Because the cost of petrol affects every facet of our lives. That affects the cost of food, that affects the cost of where, uh, because, uh, you know, you use uh, fuel to manufacture things, to transport yourself about. It's terrible. This is not right. And I think the people who are in power, they really need to understand that this is not right. And when you push, my people, my people have a saying that even if it's a goat, you push a goat too far, the goat will bite you. Hmm. I think they have pushed Nigerians too far now. Yeah, well, but in a case where uh, if Nigerians want to say something, you'll just hear one, one group coming up. I don't know where, when they register these groups, what, with one funny name, and start to say, uh, uh, we are not part of this, we're, we're, we support the government, we're doing this, we're doing that. The propaganda machinery is, is so terrible nowadays in Nigeria, you wouldn't even know which voice is true and which one is not. Because if people are coming out to say that uh, we support government even when we are hungry, I, I don't know what they intend to achieve, except that maybe the same government is paying them to do that. And then if you're standing as a lone voice, you are labeled as uh, someone who wants to overthrow the government. That's the first thing they say, that you want to overthrow the government, so they will not even consider what you're saying. How do we even begin to change uh, this narrative that we're finding in Nigeria right now? It's terrible. Uh, can we move to another, another paper right now? Uh, on, the, on the Guardian newspaper, we have uh, uh, this... Uh, this headline which says that um, uh, Bill Gates warns of rising misery says Nigeria spends loss, uh, less uh, per capita on its people. Uh, but this is not the point of interest. The point of interest is on federal government reviews prisoners feeding allowance by 50% raises budget to 45 billion naira. 
that's another thing that has come. So the federal government also knows maybe that uh, uh, even the economic hardship that we are facing outside has entered the prison. So they are raising the budget by 45 billion naira. Uh, uh, before I talk about the, the, the prisoners' uh, uh, for food allowance, you rightly said that uh, there, there will be some sort of uh, anonymous groups that can come forward making all sorts of claims, which is usual. You see that in all societies, and that's what democracy is about. Democracy is that everybody should have their say, but it, it is about numbers. So I know in Nigeria today, if you put 10 Nigerians today together, Nine of them will say what is happening is not good. Perhaps it's that one lone voice. So let more Nigerians come forward with their voices. We have been taking this thing with utmost docility. You know, and like I tell people, it is the middle class, the educated middle class of any nation that is the conscience of that nation. Nigerian middle class are the ones that are not. They are not even talking, you know. So we, we need to come out. And look, it's not always going to the streets. There are many other avenues that we can let our voices heard. These days, social media provides us a platform to do that. You know, so we, we shouldn't care about those voices that come and say we, we, we are happy to be suffering. Even in the times of Jesus Christ, we have people like that who were supporting all sorts of evil. So let Nigeria just continue to fight this battle. Then coming to prisoners' food, I think it's becoming the case now that Nigeria may even decide that let them just go, go to prison. <laughs> because if you are in prison, it's the government that is feeding you. Mm. And uh, you are not paying transportation costs, you are not paying rent, you are not paying electricity bill, you are not paying all those things that just trouble your life. You are not even uh, at risk of kidnappers or bandits. You know, you are inside the four walls of a prison. There are prison guards and even military guarding you. It's like you are in a presidential palace where they are feeding you, they are looking after all your needs. Perhaps that is what will maybe be better for Nigeria now, given how difficult life outside the prison walls is. Otherwise, the, the, the budget to feed a prisoner per day, per meal, times three or 30 days is definitely more than 70,000, uh, which is the minimum wage that government is offering. Uh, so at some point, at the, some point, the government came out and said it was about, was it 12,000 per day per prisoner? And it was so laughable for people who have con had contact with prisons to see what goes on in the prison. You, you will just weep for Nigeria if you say a prisoner is, there is a, a 14,000 naira or 12,000 naira budget for a prisoner daily, and you find out what they eat. It's people that come from outside that give them uh, brushes to brush their teeth, uh, toothpaste to, to brush their teeth with, uh, soap to bathe, and even sometimes food that they can eat. In fact, we saw one, one influencer in Nigeria who just, was just released from jail after six months saying that while he was in jail, he fed over 2,500 people in that jail. So far, the authorities have not come out to say that is a lie, which means maybe it is it's a possibility that a, an inmate was the one that facilitated the feeding of 2,500 2, people, buying a cow and all that to make sure that the people fed well. And it's a terrible situation. But now they're increasing this. Where will it go? Will it go to the prisons or will it go to some bank account somewhere that we do not know? It, is only, it will definitely be some bank account somewhere where we don't know. It's the same thing we're talking about, Bill Gates. If he attempts to put his money mm. in the Nigerian bureaucracy, he should forget about it. Because I've been to prison myself. I, have, um, I, I, I go to prison in December. Uh, go, go have prison uh, minutes to go see the prisoners and all of that. The conditions in the prisons are dire. You know, you can never believe that that's a place where they're spending 12000 per prisoner. That means it's 360000 mm. a month per prisoner. Mm. There's absolutely nothing like that. There's no evidence to show anything like that. So that's Nigeria. That's probably bureaucracy for you. But in your opinion, how will uh, the economic situation affect this um, 
uh, the wooing of the president going around the globe trying to woo people. The same Guardian is saying uh, Tinubu woos Chinese investors, says Africa holds opportunities for growth. Do we really have these opportunities for growth? Or even though we have them, are we even interested in this growth at all? You, you, I mean, I always make this analogy. The analogy that you are a hotel owner and your hotel is unkempt. The rooms are totally unkempt. Uh, there is no food in the hotel. There is no light. There is no water. Security is porous and all that. And then you are busy going all over the place looking for guests to come into your hotel. Whereas even the guests were already lost, they are packing out and going. It's just a fruitless, fruitless exercise. Since we started the democratic journey, right from President Obasan Jaw to Yaradua to Jonathan to uh, Buhari to Tinibuna, they have always been going abroad that they are looking for investors. Have the investors come? How can the investors come when you have 3,000 megawatts of electricity? Security is so porous. When they say they've gone to Zamfara, Sokoto, they've killed 150 people. The world is hearing that. You know, we live in an info age now. It's no longer like before where things can be happening in Nigeria and nobody knows about it. Now, immediately it happens. The entire world is hearing about that. And you want people to now bring their money, bring their staff and all of that to a place where people can be kidnapped and, you know, government agencies do nothing about it. So... You have to pay ransom. And if you want to pay ransom, National Assembly is busy making a law to criminalize you, pay ransom to release your people so that they can jail you. Your man is in the kidnappers then. You, who was trying to help get him out, is now in jail. Is that a place you want to come to where there's no rule of law? You know, the, the courts are manipulated. Decisions are porous. You know, people cannot even uh, express their minds because they will be arrested and jailed. You know, we're not running a democracy. Let's not forget about this. You know, sit back at home, shut yourself out. No, nobody in Dubai goes around the world looking for investors. They've done their homework, and the world is going to Dubai. So mm -hmm. it, 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 there's nothing that's going to change. I mean, unfortunately. President Tinubu isn't doing anything different. So I don't expect him that he will get different results from his predecessors. Nothing is going to come. Nothing significant. Okay, let's take a final one, a political one, uh, on the Punch newspaper. PDP shifts National Working Committee meeting over Governor Wike's tension. Uh, we've seen what Wike has been doing. We've heard what he has been saying uh, in this country, how he will put fire in every state uh, threatening the sitting governors of PDP in all over the, the country is threatening them that if they say anything about uh, River State or support a sitting governor of River State, then he's going to put fire in every state. And PDP seems to be cowed about this. They don't want to even talk about it, even though they have come out to say that um, uh, nobody is above the law. I heard another very laughable thing from a, chief, a PDP chieftain saying that whoever is trying to destroy PDP, God will judge. Like, you know, did God write your constitution for you or something? I don't know why Wike is still working free in Nigeria, even though his utterances to me are the real thing that you could call treason or attempted treason or a threat of treason. Yeah, I mean, uh, these are the kind of things we're talking about. You are abroad looking for investors. And the global headlines about your country is that a responsible person like a minister of uh, the Federal Republic is speaking like an adversary, you know, speaking with an uncouth language and saying, I'm going to put fires in certain states. And you want investors to, to bring their their monies and their staff and their technology to those states when a responsible government official is saying, I'm going to put fires in those states. Putting fires in those states means putting fires with their investments. Mm -hmm. And nobody is calling him to order. The Inspector General of Police has not invited him 
to come and quiz him on what he, he meant by that. You know, so this is why I say we're not a democracy. <laughs> and uh, let's not just be deceiving ourselves. I can go to the market now and I can sew the uniform of a major general. And I'll wear it and I'll be looking like a major general, but I'm not a major general. You know, I'm a bloody civilian. So we can be wearing the garment of a democracy, but we are not a democracy. And until we start being a democracy, I don't think there's going to be any full movement in this country. That's just what it is. We have to be a democracy. Oh, well, I hope we get to that point where we will not be complaining. Uh, where you are right now, a lot of things that are, that are happening to you and that are available to you are prayer points in Nigeria. Uh, if you were in Nigeria now, maybe by now the light would have gone off and you'd be struggling to uh, go to charge your, uh, put on your generator or something. Uh, because we've had several guests, even on the show, that uh, while they are talking, their light will just go off. And it's a terrible thing. We hope that we'll get to a point where we can, we can clap for our leaders and say, and say they are doing something. A point where they will come to campaign at our, or in our villages and tell us what they are going to do. And we really see it, uh, see it and believe it as a policy statement that if they get into office, they are going to do. Like what is happening in America now. Trump is promising a lot of things, and if he gets into office, he will focus on those things. Uh, Kamala Harris is also promising a lot of things, and if he, she gets into office, she's going to implement those things. In Nigeria, you just come, and you sit in one place, PDP, APC, LP, all the parties that sit in one place, use the same uh, manifesto, change the language, and bring it to Nigerians. And when they get into office, they do what they like. And I don't know what time we can get to that. I don't know where, what will start to change because the box, to me, lies on the table of the leaders. But the leaders are not doing well. What will they let do? So let me just, uh, in summary, um, let's say what we have always been saying. The office of the citizen, what are we failing in? What better can we do to make sure that our Nigeria or our leaders sit up and accept their responsibilities and do what they're supposed to do. You, you have just hit the, the, the nail on the head. When you were speaking, I was say, wait, you will learn, and I will tell you something. Where I'm sitting now, um, it's a small place, it's Langley, it's like a village, uh, not too far from Vancouver. Um, everything is here. The difference between a small community like where I am now and a city a metropolitan city like Vancouver is the population. It has nothing to do with the facilities. So where I am, the electricity is 247, there's water, the roads are good, there's telephone, there's security, there's everything here in this small Langley as I'm sitting here. You know, everything people in Vancouver have, they have it here. So there's no way you will say, oh, the roads in Abuja are fine, then in Nyanya they are not fine. In Wagorada, no, 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 no. Everything in Vancouver is in this language. But now, let me say what I wanted to say. Do you see a situation where hmm, a, a somebody steals something, like in a market, and Nigerians feel so angry about it, and they hold this person, they beat him up, most of all, they would visit jungle justice on him. And the same Nigerians are praising politicians who have stolen their money and are riding in big convoys and building big houses. That is where the problem is coming from. Nigerians must take Nigeria as their own personal property. And anybody stealing from Nigeria needs to be treated in the same anger with which we treat those petty thieves. That is the difference in Canada here. Canadians know that Canada belongs to them. Canada is their country. And they will not allow any leader to come and spoil Canada for them. So they put eyes on the leaders. They take Canada as their personal property. Nigerians are yet to get to that point. We are yet to get to that point. So in the market, we think that what the thief has stolen is our personal property. But the money in the government coffers that they are stealing, we don't take it as our personal property. That is why we don't care. We are rather evil worshipping them for stealing that money. That is where the paradigm shift needs to come in. We have to take Nigeria and the Treasury as our personal property and become intolerant of those who are mismanaging it. 
Yeah, but when you are intolerant, you might end up in jail for treason, that you are calling for a change in governance. That means you are calling for uh, the removal of a sitting president or governor or anything, and then we, they use big words and intimidate you and put you in jail, and then you cannot say anything anymore. Because as we speak, there are people in jail because of treason. And the treason is that they were part of end bad governance uh, protests. Whether they were waving flags of other countries or not is insignificant as far as I'm concerned. But they are in prison. And it's only just now that NBA has said, you know what, whatever their case may be, we are going to support them and make sure, and I've given directive to all the state branches to make sure that anybody who is there in jail because of end bad governance, whatever the case may be, they should get defense uh, from the NBA. But that is where we are. We hope that we'll, we'll get out of this conundrum one day. We'd like to thank you, Mr. Agule, for coming yeah, on the program. I, I, was, I, was, I was about to say, Nyamgo, that the journey to liberation is not a day's journey. Uh, if you know the number of South Africans that laid their lives in the apartheid uh, movement, the number of South Africans that laid down their lives, um, even in the United States, which is on the southern border with Canada here, where I am, if you know the number of uh, blacks that laid down their lives uh, for the civil rights, you know, there must be a group of people that will lay down their lives for the generations to come to enjoy freedom. So this is just what it is. And that is why people like me, I'm talking here, but you will soon see me in Nigeria. I'm not going to stay here in October, when, from October, when we're having these interviews. I'll be taking them in Nigeria. If they want to let them come for me. Mm. You know, we just have to be ready to sacrifice. If that sacrifice is not there, we can never be liberated because mm. these guys are not going to allow us to throw in and walk away with freedom. Well, thank you, Mr. Agule, for coming on the program. It's always a pleasure having you. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, it's now 12 midnight here, so it's my good morning. So I'll tell you good morning. Mm. Have an, a peaceful rest. <laughs> okay, we'll be talking with Mr. Nick Agule, a uh, public affairs analyst on uh, the show. We were reviewing the, top, uh, the headlines on some of our national dailies. We will take a break now. When we return, we'll return with our first hot topic, which is fuel scarcity in Nigeria, rising costs, and widespread public frustration. Stay with us.